Hey guys, I'm Cadroth, and today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about news here. So obviously you guys have seen the announcement by now that Pekora is going to actually be our official ambassador for anniversary here on JP. The interesting question that has been brought to me and been asked several times at this point is that, you know, does Anaplex understand this? Does uh, Lasengle and, and Type Moon, do they know how to market? Is this them finally figuring it out? And the answer to this question, I'm going to kind of go through with you guys on a case-by-case -case basis and let you guys decide. So from right here, from the get-go, Pekora is obviously a huge step forward. As you guys know, she has been getting permission to be able to cover the game and stream the game, and that has been a huge boon to the game's overall popularity amongst at least the VTubing community and people that watch her. So that, I do think, is a good thing. And I've said this time and time again, that this is actually something that Anaplex and Type Moon and LaSingle all need to be doing, is they do need to be utilizing their content creators. Again, this is a game going on its eighth year. It is certainly going to need all the help it can get in terms of its marketing department. People out there actually extolling the virtues of the game to help combat the negative publicity that this game has from all of its ex-players at this point. In fact, if you guys haven't seen it, you will see it anywhere you go to in any one of the FGO communities that there are always these sort of doomers that hang around the community that have long since quit the game and just sit there trying to shit on it. You'll also see it if you ever go to any other community involving gacha games that people just tend to have a negative opinion about FGO. Occasionally you'll find active players that will say good things about it, but they're far more likely to be drowned out by all the naysayers. So. That's a huge issue that you have, regardless of the of whatever gotcha game you're playing. But it just seems like FGO's X players all have a tendency to be extremely salty and extremely vindictive. So having people that actually are speaking and promoting the good parts of the game is essential. Now, the one thing I've got to point out with all of this is it is hypocrisy. That is to say, as a content creator for the game and a longtime streamer will actually be celebrating my fifth anniversary streaming the game. And I have certainly noticed that there is a rule in place by Anaplex that states that you are not allowed to stream this game, which is very hilarious to then watch as they have allowed someone to stream their game albeit with express permission, but then also held them up to be the official ambassador of the game for its eighth anniversary. So really weird to have a company that sits here and on one hand says, hey, look at this cute streamer, please, please play our game. And then also says, hey, you're not allowed to stream our game to anyone else. So that's a case of them not having it figured out. And I don't know why they've had that policy in place for years. And if you doubt me, Feel free to contact support and ask them. Just tell them that you stream the game and you will probably immediately get a response that says, don't do that. And I know because I've done it. So it's a very weird thing whenever you end up reaching out to them or talking to them and you find out that they actually don't promote that nor want you to do it. Again, they haven't really ever come after the streamers in that regard. There have been a couple of times where here on Twitch or on YouTube, they have tried to copy strike us and do stupid stuff to us. And that's never a good thing. But they've never actually, you know, come out, you know, all guns blazing and trying to actually get rid of us. So in that regard, I think they understand that content creators are still helping their game for the most part. Now, from there, we can actually focus a little bit more on what they are doing in terms of their active marketing. For instance, we certainly know that they do run ads on YouTube. You don't actually get them very often. That is an interesting thing that I've denoted that several people who are new to the community seem to persist getting YouTube ads. But then there's also people that have been around for years that don't ever see a YouTube ad for FGO, which is rather odd given the fact that that would be showing up in any sort of data sharing that these websites do, since we know they actually collect and share our data, particularly for advertising purposes. So very interesting to see that some people just seemingly never get an FGO ad. So you wonder, is it a case of maybe they're not spending enough? Maybe they're not, you know, actually trying as hard as, say, like something like Genshin, where MiHoYo has certainly promoted Genshin and even now Star Rail a lot more 
on YouTube. Similarly, over on Twitch, we also see that where MiHoYo has allowed them to have, uh, again, like prime giveaways here on Twitch, which is basically free stuff for Genshin and has actually made it a little bit more of a focus and you will get ads for Genshin whenever you're, you know, in the anime sphere of things on Twitch. Unlike FGO, which we have never seen an actual ad over here on uh, Twitch, to my knowledge. So that's just an entire portion of the potential gotcha community that they are losing out on by never targeting that. And that I would say is probably one of their big issues is that a lot of... Uh, a lot of people don't ever seem to pay Twitch any mind, even though it is a relatively big and consistent community for the game. Now, from there, we also end up having the fact that, you know, uh, and we've seen this over the years where they will actually run localized ads. And what that means is more like ads on buses and trains and billboards. This happens all over the place in Japan. I have seen it where apparently it has happened in a couple of places in California from time to time, but otherwise they are rare occurrences and they have a tendency to fall right around Anime Expo over here in the States more than anything else. So you don't actually end up seeing really anything in the grand scheme of things. So it's more like target uh, and focused advertising, which I'm not gonna say is a bad thing so much as just to say that they don't really seem to do too much of it over here in the States. You also get television commercials on the Japanese side of things that you'll just pretty much never, ever, ever see an actual television commercial for Fate over here in the States. It just seemingly is not worth their actual money. So that I think is a bigger issue. Also, just in general, there is a much more negative connotation to gacha gaming over here in the West compared to the East. So that I think is something that is a just uphill battle that they will always have to battle. But it's really weird because it almost seems like the devs feel like the IP is just meant to carry them. And certainly it can. In fact, you can argue that the IP has carried us the entire time and is really allowing us to pop off. But at the same time, it's one of those deals where I would say that, hey, it can only carry you so far and we could be doing a lot better if they actually were actively promoting the game and trying to combat some of that negativity that surrounds it. So from there, another thing that I've noticed is that they used to run art contests all the time. You guys may or may not be aware of these things, but uh, as someone that is a great connoisseur of art and loves, uh, you know, just taking a look at all the FGO art. Again, we have the art of the day panel that we do every single day here on stream. Always source the artwork and try to give the artists love that are actually drawing characters from fate. But it's one of those deals where I think for years now, they have not really been running them to the quality that they were in the early years of FGO. We used to see Pixiv art contests for FGO all the time, and now instead we actually see them for Genshin. We see them for Star Rail. MiHoYo took that tactic and is doing it a lot better than FGO is, and I have no idea why, because that's their tactic that they kind of had already figured out. So it's seemingly at some point they just stopped actually spending the budget to do it nearly as often. So that's not a good thing. In that regard, I can say that, yeah, they need to be stepping that back up. They also have a tendency to do magazine interviews every now and then, but these are typically only ever done at certain key points of the year, typically New Year's, anniversary, or maybe some big climactic event. You might see them take out an ad or, again, do more of an actual one-on-one -on -one dev interview. Those are good. I actually really like them. In fact, we are almost guaranteed to every single year get a Famitsu interview with Nasu and Takeuchi as well as Mr. Two right around Japanese anniversary. So that will be probably coming out in the next two weeks here. Again, I know Mr. Two Love Trouble is someone that actually sits down and translates the whole article. So definitely make sure you guys come check him out on Twitch if you guys haven't already. He does a great job and I usually try to type up some sort of summary of that to give us a more complete, exhaustive understanding of what was actually said in the article. Now, that being said, we only get that a couple of times a year. And that is one of the big issues that FGO has in general with this marketing is that we practically never hear from the devs. It is only during live streams that we ever actually really get any tangible info. And even then, they only talk about what's on the current agenda, never anything that's actually a concern for the game or ever really any dialogue with the actual players. 
So it takes more of these actual interviews in a magazine to hear anything of like, hey, here's what's going on behind the scenes. Here's why these decisions were made. Here's what you guys can expect in the future. And that's why they're so pivotal. They're actually the biggest moment, I would say, uh, that we find out more about what the devs are thinking and what's going on than any other time during the year. So I wish we would get more of those, but it is what it is. Now, speaking of that, speaking of live streams, and also live events for that matter. JP does a lot of live events. In a, I believe we had SakuraCon earlier in the year. We had Anime Expo. We might have Anime NYC as well. But outside of those, we don't really do much. Versus JP's side of things certainly does a lot more. They have their uh, prefecture-specific uh, tours that they do. They actually pop up, do a live stream from there from time to time. They have their winter festival that they do every year as well. So they have a tendency to have quite a few events and COVID has certainly hurt some of that. That is something to keep in mind that whenever we start talking about an actual live in-person event, that COVID has been wrecking those plans for the past couple of years. We're starting to see some of that come back now, thankfully, but hopefully we'll see that expand more into the future. I'm not going to say that NA needs to have more of those events. I would love it if they did. I'd love it if they did FGO Tour USA again and went to multiple locations, particularly one down here in Florida that I might actually be able to go to. But hey, it is what it is. That being said, I also understand that NA doesn't have nearly the budget that JP does, and so I totally get that. But that is something to take note of, is that the overall marketing in that regard is yet another one of these scenarios where it's kind of good on the JP side, not so much on the, you know, US side. Now, again, then there are also the live streams like I was talking about there too. And live streams, we get those a lot more regularly. However, the live streams are really only ever promoted on Twitter and other Japanese social medias where they would be likely to see it. So... That's really it. You don't really have any sort of advertising outside of that. In fact, there have been times, I would say, where these streams become more popularized by the community talking about it and actually hyping it up more than, you know, just the main Twitter account and retweeting it could ever do. So that is something that I think that they run into is there's not a whole lot of streams on the NA side of things. But even then, these streams are relatively flawed, I would say. And actually, I would go so far as to say that during COVID, the actual streams were better as they were all sequestered in the studio, especially on the NA side of things where Albert would actually remote in and you would actually have the stream being hosted by the Anaplex staff over in Japan with the Japanese voice actors. And it was all a pre-recorded affair that could have been edited for clarity and any hiccups that may have happened. So in that regard, I think it was actually better under the COVID years, and it was something I was pointing out here with the, their most recent debacle on NA, that that live stream did not go well. They had numerous technical issues, and uh, again, Albert had to go so far as to even say, hey, yeah, uh, you know, totally forget the last 14 minutes that just happened. So you should never have to have that sort of apology or anything like that if you are an actual professionally run stream. That being said, if you know you don't have the streaming capability, don't stream. That's kind of like streaming 101 to us over here on Twitch. We know if you don't have a good internet connection, you're going to have drop frames all the time. It's just going to stutter and sputter, and it's not going to be a good experience. At that point, just don't go live, right? So it's the same concept for them that, hey, if you don't have the, the equipment, maybe your funding isn't really there to get you good equipment, don't do a stream then, just pre-record. That will work better for you. And I went so far as to say that I don't know why they don't pre-record everything. And then what they could easily do is just have like Albert go live right after the premiere finishes and, you know, functionally handle a Q&A. So he could actually sit down and talk with people. And it could even be something that is a sort of pre-solicited list of questions. And I would actually think that that would be a lot better for them. Now, in that regard, let's talk Q&A. I actually feel like we don't have any Q&As with the devs. Albert might pick one or two questions from a YouTube that are innocuous and mean nothing and briefly mention them at the end of an NA stream. And that's it. You might get some Q&A with some of the uh, 
actual voice actors and staff over on the JP side of things. And again, you might get it over here. We have the Chaldea break rooms that happen with that regard, but none of these actually answer community questions or concerns. There is never at any point any sort of, you know, two-sided dialogue. It is instead a just one-way street where it's the devs talking to us and feeding us some things that they think we would be interested in. And that is kind of one of the issues is that at least as far as marketing goes, they can keep doing that, but it doesn't do good or look good when you never talk with your community and never find out what they're concerned or care about. I do think that's where some of those live events come into focus where, yeah, if you're actually at them, you can actually sit down and maybe have a chance to talk with Albert or one of the devs if you're lucky. But I'm going to be honest and say that that is not good enough and that only appeases the one to, you know, I'd say maybe a hundred people that actually get a piece of the devs in that sort of, sort of circumstance. That's not going to... Uh, allay the community's concerns overall. So one of the easy ways that they could do this would be to actually field questions and handpick them and answer them. And I'm not talking about the stupid things like how do you charge a servant or again, what does instinct in the game do? None of that. Answer actual questions about like, hey, why was this handled the way it was? Why did you guys translate this in this way? And I'm not saying this to allow the devs to get jumped all over. I'm saying this more from a standpoint of, I think that would actually be interesting to know. We've had several issues in the community regarding translation here recently that I think the community at least would like to know the answer to. And those issues were largely skipped over on the LB6 streams. In fact, I found it quite hilarious how uh, even with the uh, the closed captioning, they actually ended up saying uh, instead of... Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, what was it? Uh, it? It ended up being Tam Linguini was was whatever they ended up saying. Um, but it was just a, a horrible botched uh, uh, closed captioning of what was actually said. That being said, I, I do think like they even brought up the Tamlin Knights and that was one of the one of the uh, one of the translation issues. But they never actually ended up addressing like, why did we go with Tam Lin? What is the reasoning behind that? And. I've said this before on stream that I actually do believe there is a reason and that most of the people haven't looked into what Tam Lin is, but it is what it is. And so I think there are times that they could at least allay some of the community's concerns by talking a little bit more. Certainly they could get themselves in hot water if they say too much. And I think that is largely what these companies are trying to avoid is sticking their own foot in their mouth. But I do think as long as you handle it in a relatively uh, controlled environment and way, you can easily have the time to prep the answers that you need rather than taking a live Q&A necessarily. So if you were to solicit for questions, I think that would go a lot better. And we see this with the surveys as well, that they do sometimes at least ask for our feedback. How much they listen, I don't know. But I do think it's an interesting thing nonetheless. But still, I do think that they could at some point, as devs, take community questions, or even, and this is an interesting thing, if they were to switch their stance on content creators, they could instead turn to the content creators and grant some sort of interview or something like that. They could say like, hey, why don't I sit down with you? You can ask the community for questions. We will screen those questions and you can sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one and get, let us give you a truthful, actual answer live on camera or something like that. And I think that would actually be great for them. I think that would work out really well for them. There'd obviously be people that would bristle at certain comments that they would make, but I think it would go a long way towards saying, hey, yeah, we care about the community and we actually want you to understand rather than keeping you in the dark constantly. So I do think there's a lot that they could do to improve in that regard. Now, this brings me to my last point, the one point that we have seen, but that they have been relatively haphazard with, and that's dev diaries. And this one isn't even marketing at this point. This is just literally, hey, we release a video on YouTube of Mr. Two, and I'm glad that he takes the time to actually talk with us in that regard, but holy cow, they are not consistently done, and some of them basically tell us nothing we didn't already know. So in that regard, I do wish that they would do more of them 
or at least make sure that they have big announcements. And that's something I've talked with them before that at least with regards to how the NA handles, sorry, the NA staff handles things that they need to be leaning into our clairvoyance rather than trying to fight it. That is to say, when they know they have a big, awesome unit coming up that people are going to want to roll, advertise that, hype that, make some videos promoting it, throw an advertisement out there on YouTube or Twitch or something like that, try to get it in front of people and make people go, ooh, ah, that unit looks really cool. Let's roll for that unit, right? Let's come play FGO. So I do think that they could be doing that a lot better. And in that regard, leaning into the clairvoyance will also show that they care about the community and understand that the NA crowd is different than the JP crowd. But they don't do that. Instead, they try to fight us on it. So that's something they've got to do better. But again, if they were to lean into this, then we could have more forward facing discussions with the dev diaries talking about here is the upcoming schedule. We have had a couple of dev diaries that did that, but it's only happened a handful of times out of a handful of dev diaries. So it's one of those deals where they could do it a lot better if they were to lean into it. They could talk about, hey, you guys can expect in this month you'll be getting this, and this month you'll be getting this, and this month you'll be getting this. And that's not spoilery. You can literally just talk about here are the upcoming events, here is the upcoming unit, and you can do it in such a way that it is minimalized kind of in the way that you already do it on Twitter. We've already seen that they start to like promote the new unit now with a quick sort of uh, down and dirty analysis of the unit stats and stuff like that and showing off their Noble Phantasm. That's fine, but they could be doing that ahead of the banner rather than a week into the banner or in some cases a day before the banner ends. They have got to get better about that. I don't know who's in charge of their social media, but it is very slow and not at all ahead of the game. So I do think overall that there are some concerns with FGO's marketing in general, but I also think there are some things that they do right. It's just that the majority of those things are done over on the actual Japanese side. So let me know what you guys think. How do you guys think that they should handle marketing? Do you like to see stuff like this with Pekora and her actually becoming an ambassador to the game? Do you think that's a step in the right direction? I'd be curious to read your comments and hear what you guys have to say about how they handle marketing. And I'll see you guys for the next one.